Hi class, uh, welcome to your lecture video on estimating a population mean. Um, this is also going to be an introduction to the concept of confidence intervals that we're going to talk about when we come together in class. Um, but actually for today's lecture, your, your video here, we only have three objectives. Uh, the first one is to how you obtain a point estimate for a population mean. Okay, it's actually quite simple. The next one will be to state the properties of the student t-distribution. Now this is going to be a new uh, statistical table that we've never um, seen before. It's going to be a lot like the normal um, distribution table in that you're going to look values up on it, but how you get those values and the information you need is going to be a little bit different. All right, we'll actually then talk about how you determine t-values or how you use that statistical table. When we come together in class this week, we'll actually talk about the concept of confidence intervals in general, but this first part here um, is just helping us get there. Okay, so let's do the objective one. So obtain a point estimate for the population mean. All right, so the definition of what a point estimate is, is a point estimate is the value of a statistic that estimates the value of a parameter. Now, if you remember, a statistic um, is a value that's calculated from a sample, and a parameter is a value calculated from a population. But often, in the real world, we, we can't know all the values in a population, so we use a sample to estimate them. All right, and that's where we get our statistics from. All right, so for example, the population mean x bar is a point estimate for the population mean m or mu. Okay, So it's very simple. We use x bar when we have no idea what the population mean is. Let me give you an example. Um, we've done this one before. So pennies minted after 1982 are made of 97.5% zinc and 2.5% copper. The following data represents the weight in grams of 17 randomly selected pennies minted after 1982. So right here, we see the weights of these 17 um, pennies. All right, so we're going to treat this uh, data as a simple random sample. So I want to estimate the population mean of pennies minted after 1982. Well, suppose I have like no idea what the, what the weight is. Well, I'm going to use these 17 samples to get an estimate for it. Well, the sample mean right here, if I add them up, all those values from right here, I divide by 17, I get an approximate sample weight of 2.464. Alright, so the point estimate for the population mean mu, alright, for the population mean is 2.464 uh, grams. Alright, this is just, we use the value of a statistic x bar to say something about the population average. And that's okay, it's just a single point estimate. Alright, that's all point estimates are, it's just one value. Alright. Anyways, objective two, let's state the properties of the student's t-distribution. All right, if you look here, all right, suppose that a simple random sample of size n is taken from a population. The population from which the sample is drawn follows a normal, if the population from which the sample is drawn follows a normal distribution, so like the weights of pennies probably are normally distributed. So if we take a sample from that, then the distribution of this, t is equal to x bar minus whatever the population mean is, divided by the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of n. Now we've seen this before, all right? Um, this looks a lot like the z-scores we were calculating um, in, in the chapter on the distribution of the sample mean. But because we use s instead of sigma, all right, it gets this t designate. All right, so this follows a t distribution with what's called n minus one degrees of freedom. Okay, now keep that in mind or highlight that in your notes, n minus one degrees of freedom. All right, and this is where x bar is that sample mean, and s is the sample standard deviation. So it looks a lot like a z-score, it's just s instead of sigma. All right, so to kind of talk about what the t-distribution looks like, all right, uh, I want to do a, uh, another example. All right, so suppose we obtain a 1,000 simple random samples of size n is equal to 5 from a normal population, all right, where the average is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. All right, so we have a thousand samples of size fives. All right, let's determine the sample mean and sample standard deviation of each of these samples. So I'd have a thousand means and a thousand standard deviations. And I want to compute the z-score and the t-score for each sample. Okay, so one of the, the z-values will be using sigma, and the t will be using that s that we um, calculated before. Well, if we look at the z-scores, what does that look like? That looks like a nice, neat, normal distribution. All right, so these are z-scores, normally distributed. And notice how they're not really that spread out. Okay, notice how they're not spread out. Nice, very good-looking normal distribution. 
Well, if you look at these t values that use s instead of sigma, it looks like this. It also looks like a normal distribution, but you know what? It's more spread out, all right? More spread out, more area in the tail. So if you want to highlight that in your notes, more areas in the tails, okay? So the difference between z and t, z follows that normal distribution. T looks very normally distributed, but with more area in the tail. Okay, so here are some conclusions. The histogram for Z is symmetric and bell-shaped with the center of the distribution at zero and virtually all rectangles between negative three and three. So in other words, Z follows a standard normal distribution. So if I go back, definitely does, definitely looks like it. Okay, now the difference here. The histogram of T is also symmetric and bell-shaped, all right, with the center of the distribution at zero. Let me go back. All right, symmetric and bell-shaped, centered at zero. Yes, that's what we see. All right, but the distribution of T has longer tails. All right, so T is more dispersed. So it is unlikely, since it's more dispersed, that T follows a standard normal distribution. All right, it's something different. It's called the T distribution. The additional spread of the distribution can be attributed to the fact that we use S to find T instead of sigma. So we use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. Right, because the sample standard deviation of itself is a random variable, we have more distribution, we, we have more dispersion in the distribution of t. All right, so it's more spread out, more spread out. All right, so here are the properties of the t distribution. The t distribution is different for degrees of freedom, and if you go back, if you want to highlight this in your notes, degrees of freedom are n minus 1. So it's the sample size minus 1 is the degrees of freedom. So whatever the sample size is, that determines the degrees of freedom. Okay. The t distribution is centered at 0 and is symmetric about 0. All right. The area under the curve is 1, just like the standard normal curve. Since it's symmetric, the area to the curve to the right of 0 equals the area to the curve of left. So 1 half is to the right and left of 0. All right, and just like the normal distribution, as t increases or decreases without bound, the graph approaches but never equals zero. So the graph, the tail areas, get smaller and smaller and smaller. All right. The difference here between the standard normal curve and the um, t distribution, all right, is that the t distribution is the area in the tails of the t distribution is a little greater than the areas of the tails in the standard normal distribution. Right? And this is because, again, we are using the sample standard deviation as an estimate for the population standard deviation, therefore introducing further variability into the t statistic. All right? That's why we have those uh, larger tails. I, I call them fatter tails. All right. Anyways, as the sample size n increases, the density curve, all right, so the curve of t gets closer and closer to the normal density curve. So it looks more and more normal. All right? So as n increases, all right, the values of s, the sample standard deviation, get closer to the values of sigma. Okay, and this is just by the logic of large numbers. And as s gets closer to sigma, the curve looks more and more normal. Let me show you an example of what I mean by that. All right, this blue one here, all right, is a normal curve. So I'm showing you two t's, one with n is equal to 15, and one where the sample size n is just 5. If you notice, as the sample size increases, it goes from 5 to 15, the curve gets more and more normal. All right, and also if you look here, all right, you notice the sample size of 15 is this pink curve here compared to the orange. It's tails. There's less area in the tails. It gets skinnier and taller as the, um, uh, as the sample size increases. Okay. What's incredibly important or what we're mostly going to use the um, T distribution for is to determine what are called T values or um, critical values. And when you come to class next week and we start constructing confidence intervals, all right, that's going to be incredibly important to be able to do correctly. All right, so I want to do a couple of examples here. And what you should do, all right, I'm going to cancel the PowerPoint for just one second, is you should have downloaded this table from the uh, online lectures, okay? Um, and we're going to use this right here to help us answer these questions, all right? So it's really important to how you, so that we learn how to read this T table, okay? All right, so the first one, find, um, Find a t-value, all right, where the degrees of freedom is 14 and the area in the tail is 0 0.05. All right, well, if you look here, df right here stands for degrees of freedom. So I said find where there's 14. 
find where the area in the tail is 0 0.05. Well, this table gives us the area in the tail here. This is what this is saying right here. All right, so the area in the tail up here, 0 0.05. Go down to where it is 14. Right here, boom, 1.761. So where the degrees of freedom and the area in the tail intersect. So I'm going to put that here. Our answer was 1.1. 171. Oh, I'm sorry. 1.761. All right, now let's do the same thing again. The degrees of freedom are 20. So let me go down here to 20. And I want the area in the tail to be 0 0.025. So I look up here and find 0 0.025. I go down to 20. And where they intersect, so 20 and 0 0.025 they intersect right here at 2.086. So 2.086, that's the T value right there. All right, two other parts. You'll notice that this next question is a little different. I tell you the sample size is 10. Well, if you remember from our notes, the degrees of freedom, DF, is N minus 1. Well, my sample size is 10. 10 minus 1 gets me 9. All right, so if I don't directly tell you the degrees of freedom, but I tell you the sample size, you can find them. All right, so DF, so I'm going to go degrees of freedom 9 right here. The area in the tail was 0 0.01. Well, that's up here. So 9, I'm going to go over to 0 0.01 where it intersects, 2.821. So this area here is 2.821. Eight two one. We got it. All right, so let's just do one last one. So here the sample size is equal to 15. Well, the degrees of freedom of that is n minus 1. So 15 minus 1 gets me 14. All right, so the area in the tail is 0 0.02. So I'm going to go to 14, which is right here. 0 0.02 is up here. So where do they intersect? Right here, 2.264. All right, being able to calculate these are gonna be incredibly important in class this week. All right, so please review this lecture. Um, your assessment for this, this week is gonna be just to calculate some values off the T table, and I will see you in class.